here and welcome everybody. It's a real thrill to be at the Tikkun. Um, we'd like to introduce you to some of the farmers and chefs we profiled in the, the book we just wrote, the Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook, which is the basis for our talk tonight. So bear with us, I'm going to show, uh, God willing, a, a two minute video and uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, let's see. In our new book, The Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook, you'll meet some of the remarkable farmers and chefs who play a heroic role in preserving the agricultural community of the area. That is, the Berkshire Hills of Western Massachusetts and neighboring New York, Vermont, and Connecticut. We tell the stories of 42 of them with personal profiles, striking photographs, and 125 kitchen-tested recipes highlighting fresh ingredients, all inspired by or created by these farmers and chefs. The story this book tells and the recipes offer a picture of small family farms that go well beyond this region. This area is a special place, attracting visitors from across the country. It's known for its homegrown food and farm to table tradition, as well as its world-class scenery and culture. The mission of our book, The Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook, is to highlight the people, places, and things that make this region so special and the story of small family farms. The dedicated farmers and farm to table chefs we write about are committed to producing food that is tastier and healthier than what's often found in the supermarket by maintaining healthy soil and farming and producing food sustainably. And as importantly, the meat farmers we interviewed are consistently concerned with treating their animals humanely. It's tough to do this work. Are motivated to farm for environmental, social, political, health, lifestyle, and even spiritual reasons, often sacrificing a comfortable living for their values. Who could foresee when we began our journey four years ago to write the Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook that its mission to inspire consumers to buy local would be more important than ever when it came out in May 2020. During this time and beyond, we need to support these hardworking and principled people. Our book, website, and Facebook page suggest ways you can buy their products even now. I'm Rob Bildner. And I'm Elisa Spangen Bildner. Our new cookbook, The Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook, sheds light on the farmers and the farms of the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York. Thanks so much. So um, just a little background and you've heard way too much and we apologize for that. But um, we've spent most of our careers in the food business. I'm the third generation and my son Rafi, uh, about whom you'll hear, is an artisanal pizza maker, went to the Cordon Bleu. My son Ari ran a craft brewery and is a consultant in the wine business. And uh, Elisa, who uh, is a uh, trained chef, is a former journalist, a journalism professor, and has a master's in nutrition, as you heard, and ran one of the two companies we founded that brought specialty foods and produce to the retail food stores. We help many farmers bring their products to market. So our cookbook's goal, of course, is to help you, of course, create great food. Um, but this other objective is to offer compelling reasons to buy and to eat local and how to do it, now more important than ever. However, tonight we're gonna to add some more reasons, the Jewish reasons, um, which is the crux of our talk tonight. So we were inspired to jump into this uh, project when Rafi, our son, began gardening uh, in Beckett, Massachusetts, in uh, the back of our house, um, each summer, selling his produce at a roadside stand. In high school, uh, there's a picture of Rafi. In high school, he went to the mountain school in Vermont and he learned how to farm professionally came back and during two summers started October Mountain Farm on, again, in our backyard. And it became a half acre 
of heavily, you know, intensively cultivated veggies, some normal, lettuce, et cetera, others exotic. And he would sell these items, not just as a roadside stand, which he used to, but now at farmer's markets uh, in West Stockbridge, in Great Barrington, in, in all over the Berkshires. We visited Rafi at these markets and we marveled at his produce, just as we marveled at the produce of the other people who were selling. But we were very much aware of the long hours and the grueling work it took to get that produce to market. Um, we were also very much aware of how little money he made, um, considering also that he didn't have to pay rent or buy land as the other farmers did. On Friday, while we were celebrating Shabbat, Rafi was up all night uh, processing his produce, washing it, bagging it, getting ready for the Saturday markets. At these markets, we met local farmers who, and were moved by stories of how they came to farm, their challenges, their commitment to working a very healthy soil, to protecting the environment, and to producing clean, tasty food. We, one farmer we met, Amelia Conklin of Skyview Farm, told us, Anybody that's eaten a carrot that's been grown locally, organically, sustainably, knows that it just has an extraordinary taste compared to a carrot that's traveled 1,200 miles from the West Coast to the East. We thought a cookbook based on what the farmers we met grow and raise and would, be, would offer one way to support them. These are farmers who are often hidden from view, who may not intersect with our lives, but who lovingly grow and raise food that they produce for the community. So we grabbed our computer, our a digital recorder, and our, our, our a camera, and we traipsed the dirt roads of the Berkshires for over five years to learn more about these folks. So you may ask, What's Jewish about the Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook? So I was like, why are we here tonight? Well, it's true that the Berkshire's during the summer has a heavy influx of uh, Jews from uh, Boston and New York. And there's a lot of visiting rabbis that we know that come during the summer. Um, we know that the camps are full. This is during normal times. And yes, the area has a history of Jewish farmers of which we interview, we interview too. But more importantly, we argue that the 42 local farmers and chefs that we profiled operate their small family farms in ways that parallel Jewish precepts concerning agriculture and food, whether these individuals are Jewish or not. Supporting small family farms is a quintessentially Jewish uh, activity. And it's worth changing the way that we uh, buy and eat our food to seek out what these purveyors value. Um, so that because we'd be incorporating, doing so, we're incorporating in our lives Jewish values like bal tashkit, do not waste, sa'ar balei chayim, do not let animals suffer, oshik, don't oppress our labor, labor, and others that we might be able, if we have time, to touch upon. We'll elaborate on each of these principles and then tell the stories of the farmers that exemplify each one. Um, I strongly suggest a, a book that was very, very helpful to me. I uh, would recommend reading at The Sacred Table, Creating a Jewish Food Ethic, by, edited by Mary uh, Zamor, and also material by Chazon, which was also extremely helpful. We just mentioned Baal Tashkit, which literally means do not destroy. It's foremost based in Deuteronomy, and it's constantly invoked by Jewish environmentalists to illustrate the idea that we must care for the earth. Quote, when in your war against a city, you have to besiege it a long time in order to capture it, you must not destroy the, its trees, wielding the ax against them. You may eat of them, but you may not cut them down. So even in war, we must treat the environment with respect. In Genesis, Adam and Eve were anointed Shomrei Adama, guardians of the earth. Beyond the Torah, Kohelet Rabbah says, be mindful that you do not spoil and destroy my world. For if you spoil it, there is no one after you to repair it. A 13th century commentator says that Baal Tashkit should be interpreted to mean not wasting food, not even a grain of mustard. Chabad.org says, quote, if Jews must not cut, cut down fruit trees in the extreme case of a war when destruction is the norm, how much more so does this apply to normal life? Kevin Kleinman in the Sacred Table cites the Babylonian Talmud, which says that when barley bread is available, but instead one eats wheat bread, one violates Baal Tashkit. 
When you have a choice, one is obligated to consume food that requires fewer resources and is less expensive. Barley at that time was the poor person's food. Translated to our talk tonight, patronize local farms that employ methods that do not waste food and that show care for the soil and the environment. So as a side note, but also important, Batsheva Appel on the Sacred Table argues that being a locavore is a Jewish value and she bases it on the Jer uh, Jerusalem Talmud. According to Rabbi Yosei, quote, it is forbidden to live in a town that has no garden or greenery. In other words, she infers in a town that has no, uh, without a source of fresh produce. We preserve these green spaces and stop development when we buy local because we're allowing small family farms to succeed. But the ramifications go beyond just any one locality. The availability of locally grown food reduces dependence on food that has to be schlepped across the country, um, which is our current norm, adding to environmental destruction, violating Baal Tashkit. And similarly, this norm puts a premium on growing the few hardy varieties that can make it for the schlep, um, reducing biodiversity. Agribusiness is based on monoculture, and as a result, it wastes, again, <clears throat> Baal Tashkit, waste heritage breeds and heirloom vegetables. So I, what I'd like to do is actually start with a story, uh, first story of a farm, and that's Hawk Dance Farm. When we first visit, visited these uh, farmers, you'll see in a second, Damon Clift and Diane Creed, um, they just finished a dinner of beet pancakes, and beets are just one of 90 uh, plants they grow on their three acre farm. There, that's a picture of Damon. And I just want you to want to point out, you'll see how he's hand, uh, high, hand farming and barely touching the soil. So back to their dinner, um, which was inspired, which inspired our recipe for beet and goat cheese latkes, uh, which is in the book. But anyway, Hillsdale, New York, is, uh, which is where their farm is located, is about 120 miles from Queens, which is where they moved from to get to Hillsdale. At that point, Damon was a house painter and Diane was a vet tech and also had a pet sitting business. They were moved by Back to the Landers, Scott and Helen Nearing, by Elliot Coleman, who's an uh, organic and soil uh, advocate. And they decided to move upstate to start their, start their farm. And they, they did you know, learn farming before they did so. The pair farm sustainably. They don't use chemicals, they don't use pesticides, they don't use herbicides. And I should point out, Sustainable farming often goes well beyond organic farming, uh, even certified organic farming. So they, like some other farmers that we interviewed, farm by hand, as you saw, barely tilling the soil, if at all, which is much better for the environment because the carbon stays in the earth and doesn't go up into, into the atmosphere. So these two are adamant about living their ideals. Um, being in tune with the earth, as they say, they only use organic, non-GMO seeds. And as Diane says, we believe in supporting uh, that kind of food because I don't want to be a genetic experiment and I don't want my customers to be either. And everything we grow, she says, is done with such love and such care that we want people to feel that when they eat it. We want them to feel when they bite into one of our tomatoes, what we feel, the joy we feel, how delicious it is, and how hard it took for us to get it to that point. As one of their customers wrote on Facebook, um, let me know when you have more cherry tomatoes. Lucy and I ate ours in like an hour today. So just to quickly round out the picture of Hawk Dance, a little bit beyond Baal Tashkit, when we met Damon and Diane in 2015, they'd been farming for a number of years, and that was the first year they made a profit of $3,000. They acknowledged they had a very romantic vision of farming, which they now learn was flawed. It's really hard, Damon said, and we didn't have emergency funds to back, to back us up. When he can, he paints, off season, he paints houses off season, and together the two create uh, beeswax candles, which they sell at crafts fairs. Their story isn't an easy one, but Diane gave us a one-word answer when we asked her if she had any regrets um, about making the move from Queens to Hillsdale. Absolutely not, she said. We followed our dream. And even if we're not getting rich, we, at least we can say we're doing what we believe in. The second story we'd like to share is about the primers of Wildstone Farm, and that's a farm in, um, in Vermont. 
And this is a, uh, a picture of Joy and John Primer. And the Primers um, primarily grow garlic. They're a diversified, uh, certified organic farm, but garlic's their crop. And they taught us a lot about that crop. And again, why buying local matters. You won't see the kind of garlic they grow in your supermarket. They, they grow sometimes more than 12 varieties. Joy tells us her favorite depends on what she's cooking because some garlic's better eaten raw and some's better when it's cooked. We think of garlic as uh, commonplace, but it turns out it's a very hard crop to grow. They plant in October, they harvest in July, and then they have to dry it. They grade their garlic for size and quality and believe theirs has more nutritional value than other garlic because of their care for the soil and the seeds, which are their own. John and Joy are fiercely committed to growing organically and sustainably. They uh, use solar power. They bring their water from a, uh, from a spring below their house, and they mainly use hand tools. When we buy from farmers like Joy and John, we're buying from people who passionately care about their land, the health of, their, of the soil, their crops, and the community. While the primers eat off their farm, quote, I don't think we've uh, had a, uh, bought anything since we came here. If they do have to buy something, they buy local. As John told us, it may sound weird, but the love that we put into our work and the care for our land somehow comes out in our produce. So another two very short little vignettes about why buying local um, supports the principle of Baal Tashki. So first story. Uh, there's a well-known company in the Berkshire called Hasta Hill. It sells sauerkraut, which is fantastic. They do fermented products. The owners are Maddie Elling and Abe Hunricks. Um, and they, uh, they're, wait, hold on, almost. <laughs> okay, there they are. There they are. Um, they used to farm their own vegetables, and they decided it was too hard to have two different businesses. And that didn't pay, it didn't make sense for them. So instead, they decided to outsource the farming. In 2018, they bought over 40000 dollars worth of organic produce from local farmers. They say that a local company that sells fermented products like theirs can be a real boon to area farmers looking to sell produce that frankly may not be able to make it to, into the supermarket. Um, it's a great way, says Maddie, to use up vegetables that aren't necessarily pretty or in perfect condition. We're able to take some bruised vegetables. The quality is still really high, but maybe they've been in storage and the outer leaves have wilted. And she and Abe are very proud that they can, quote, turn them into beautiful sauerkraut in a jar with an awesome label and benefit farmers who not, not, might not be able to sell them otherwise. In other words, they would be wasted. Um, second vignette, a uh, quick one. So this is about farmer, farmer Dominic Palumbo and his road to farming, like that of Hawk Dance, uh, and so many other farmers we spoke to, was a really tough one, wasn't easy. Hold on, let's see if we can get him. Um, in 2016, he faced foreclosure on his farm, Moon on the Pond. There's a picture of the farm in Sheffield. Oh, sorry. Oh, hold on, we might get to it. In Sheffield, Massachusetts. Eventually turning his farm into a nonprofit and raising money from large and small donors, helped by a very fortuitous tweet from Michael Pollan. For Dominic, each time he sells at a farmer's market, each time he gives a customer that freshly, a taste of that freshly grown cucumber, he has the opportunity to help them, to help others understand the value of buying local and buying clean food. That includes, by the way, the meat that he sells. He's a meat farmer as well, which doesn't come from what Dominic calls, quote, a system that is morally, environmentally, and health-wise bankrupt. In fact, he says, and I love this quote, quote, red, and meat and bad should not be inextricably linked. Red meat, naturally raised like he does and other farmers, is great for you in balance. Carrots and vegetables are horrible for you if they're raised using bad chemicals and deficient soil. So an environment, environmentalist like Dominic is convinced that uh, small farms like his, regional farming, will be the savior of this country's food system enabling us to be resilient in the face of climate change and frankly, now in face of this pandemic. As Dominic says, if most of our food comes from the Central Valley of California, and uh, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble when it becomes either impossible to grow there, which may happen, or impossible to get it, 
from there to here, part of what we're seeing today. The second Jewish value we mentioned is the core principle to our Balei Chayim, don't let animals suffer. God gives you, uh, humans dominion over animals in Genesis, but it's tempered by many other Torah passages that demand we prevent their suffering. So our Balei Chayim is said to derive from Exodus. When you see the ass of your enemy lying under its burden and would refrain from raising it, you must nevertheless help raise it. Other passages that add to this principle. An ox is not to be muzzled when threshing in a field of corn so that he too can eat. Don't slaughter an animal and its young on the same day, which shows mercy. Don't take a mother bird with her eggs. The mother should be shooed away so she doesn't see her eggs being taken. A farmer should not plow with an ox and ass, an ass together to prevent the stronger from injuring the weaker. Sa'ar so Balei Chaim is even codified in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or do, your daughter, your male or female slave, or your cattle. So we left off telling farmer stories with Dominic Palumbo, arguing that agribusiness uh, lets animals suffer, I'm paraphrasing, but he would say this, suffer in the name of mass marketing, providing a cheap and very unhealthy food. How unlike the meat farmers that we met, concerned with treating their animals humanely and with respect. A confession here, I'm a vegan, Rob is a pescatarian, so we do not eat meat. But after writing our book um, and interviewing local meat farmers, we feel strongly that if a person chooses to eat meat, it would be great if they could purchase it, if possible, from local farmers like the ones we interviewed. So I'd like to spend a few moments on farmers Schuyler and Colby Gale of Climbing Tree Farm in New Lebanon, New York. So I'm gonna give you a Zoomer alert. Um, it was suggested that I not tell stories about pig farmers since it is Shavuot, it's a Jewish holiday, and it's a primarily Jewish audience. And I do wanna welcome my friends, and I've seen they've come on, who are not Jewish, and thank you for joining us as well. So I appreciate the suggestion, but the Gales raise heritage breed pigs and are perhaps the most thoughtful farmers we interviewed on treating animals with respect and in their own way, and although they're not Jewish, following Sa'ar Ba'alei Chaim. So we start our profile in the book, bear with me, in saying that this is the story of happy to be farming, but conscious ex-vegetarian pig farmers who raise animals instinctually using regenerative practices. It's a mouthful, I promise you in the book, we parse every single word. We'll try to do a few of them here. Um, but just let me start by just telling you that Colby and Schuyler uh, took six years to find their land. It's very hard for farmers to afford land. Through the help of a land conservancy, they bought 20 acres, leased about 300 more um, in New Lebanon. And um, as Schuyler says, pigs need a lot of space, quote, especially those allowed to express their natural instincts, who freely roam the woods as their forebears did. What it means to raise pigs instinctually, she says, is, quote, for a farmer to look at the world through a pig's eyes. Before the gales turned to pigs, they raised sheep, they raised hens, but they got really sick and tired of washing 450 eggs a day and having kids, uh, hens walk into their kitchen. And when they, um, turned to raising heritage pigs, they found they were actually really good at it. And now they raise about 60 to 120 a year. But they do it with the most extraordinary ethical wariness. As Colby says, we're taking lives for consumption and that's not something to be taken lightly. Schuyler, who has a great blog, says that people always ask her how they feel about slaughtering them, uh, slaughtering her animals. It's sad every time she says, or she writes, these are living things some of whom are extremely cute and are animals we have known all our lives, um, that we've known all our lives and who we've become you know, very close to. We respect when killing animals we care about becomes nonchalant and fails to stir our emotions, then we will all know to stop raising animals for meat. We respect our animals in life and we are thankful for them in death. 
The Gale's pigs live on grass and wander around in the woods year round, grazing on foraging crops that actually the Gales have planted. But Skylar really bristles if you call their pigs uh, pasture raised. What she and Colbert are shooting for, she says, is pigs raised on regenerative agriculture. Pasture raised, she says, doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything good to eat on the grass or in the land, and that, or that the land is staying healthy. Regenerative means leaving the land healthier than when we started, which is what they want to do. Some shorter takes on other farmers and their caring relationship with animals they raise, such as cheesemaker Topher Sabbat from Williamstown, uh, Mass. And uh, I apologize for the uh, little technical blitz here, there but these are the happy cows of cheesemaker Topher Sabbat. To to we wish we had time to tell you Topher's whole story, but we're gonna again refer you to the cookbook for that. Uh, Topher's uh, efforts to improve the lives of his animals led him to make an unusual decision regarding male calves born on that farm. Even if a farmer is using bulls for breeding, he says, typically they might keep one, maybe two a year. As for the rest, most farms, quote, just put them in a truck, send them to auctions, and they end up in the conventional beef and veal supply. It's not a pleasant experience. Topher decided this was not something Cricket, Cricket Creek would participate in and the farm works hard to market calves they don't keep. This year, they sold 23 to people as far away as Rhode Island for breeding or who will raise them in a small homestyle operation. Quote, that's a wonderful thing because, because we know they're gonna be well cared for with a higher quality of life. Topher urges consumers to think critically about the source of their food. Quote, just because it's local, it doesn't mean it's good. He adds the best way to understand what you're eating is to buy directly from the farmer. While he knows it's not always possible, he tells us he's delighted to get mail from people as far away as Boston who email him and, and ask him, oh, we saw your cheese. How do you treat your cows? So two quick mini profiles, a farm to table chefs, who also express concern about animal welfare, which you'll see is very um, intertwined with the principle of Baal Tashki. So why do we include profiles of farm to table chefs? Well, this is a cookbook. And although we're less focused on it in this talk, feel free to ask us questions about food if you want to later. Um, the, as we said, the, the, the a cookbook feels, uh, uh, features 125 recipes um, inspired by the farms we visited. And, uh, uh, some of the recipes are also adapted from farm to table chefs, two of whom I'm gonna profile now very, brief, very briefly. So the first chef I'd like to introduce you to is Nancy Thomas, who is the owner of Meze Bistro and Bar in Williamstown, and there's a picture of Nancy. And she's a proponent, along with other chefs and other restaurateurs, um, including our collaborator, Chef Brian Auberg, of what's called, quote, nose to tail dining. Nose to tail uses every part of an animal in cooking, wasting as little as possible. Thomas was known for taking her chefs to visit one of her purveyors, Kim Wells of East Mountain Farm, so that the chefs could get, uh, develop a relationship with the animals and meet the animals that they were going to be slaughtering. So um, our talk with Nancy led us to include her pasta bolognese recipe in our book, which she and her chef created because of her desire to buy a whole animal and use all of its cuts, including the less desirable ground beef. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Nancy told us she hosts R&D nights at her restaurants where she and her team work with lesser cuts of meat, not only to use the whole animal, which is important, but here, and I go to the Jewish emphasis on social justice, I invoke that as well, because of her concern that not everybody is able to afford local food. It's something we heard from chefs across the board. Uh, next farm to table chef who we profile is chef Peter Platt and his wife, Meredith Kennard of the famed Old Inn on the Green in New Marlborough, Massachusetts. And there's a picture of Peter and Meredith. Not only are they committed to respecting the life of the animals they use. They are emphatic about not wasting, and that includes even plants. Kennard tells the story of famed Napa Valley chef, Thomas Keller, and this may be ap apocryphal, I'm not sure, who is said trains his new chefs to slaughter, skin, and dress a rabbit. 
quote, this is, this is Meredith. He does it to teach respect for what it took to get that rabbit to the plate. You know what you went through and what the rabbit went through. It bothers Peter that unlike the most famous French chefs, uh, classic French chefs who didn't waste anything, he has colleague, per colleagues, particularly in cities where meat, where meat, I'm sorry, where meal prices are high, who will quote, use one piece of a green bean. Peter explains that he's very grateful for his British mother and her influence. He says she grew up during the war and she and her family would save their eggs every week so that they could bake a cake. We have time to mention one more principle, Oshek, which means don't oppress your worker. Leviticus commands us, you shall not defraud your fellow, you shall not commit robbery, the wages of a laborer shall not remain with you until morning. As Sean Stanton, a farmer in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, reminds us, workers in conventional large-scale slaughterhouses to toil for low wages and unacceptable conditions. Just one example of worker oppression in commercial agriculture. Sean owns North Plain Farm and runs Blue Hill Farm for Dan Barber and his family of the famed Blue Hill restaurants. His signature products are grass-fed beef, pork, chicken, eggs, and heirloom tomatoes. He told us about the difficulty of getting customers to pay the price for his grass-fed beef, something we heard from every meat farmer. Sean says his animals eat costly, certified or transitional organic feed, and slaughtering them is expensive. $400 for a pig at the small New England slaughterhouse he uses compared to the 20 or $30 in a large uh, agricultural processor. But he says what consumers don't know about are the hidden costs behind the discrepancy. Large producers slaughter 10,000 pigs a day rather than the 20 or fewer at Sean's facility, taking advantage, yes, of economies of scale. But those lower prices also result from what he argues is the inhumane way they structure the workday for those who do the, do the killing. Quote, we talk about animal rights all the time. When you go to these places, and see the kinds of jobs workers are doing for eight to 10 hours a day, it's as much a human rights issue as an animal welfare issue. At Sean's slaughter, Slaughterhouse, people work a variety of jobs throughout the day. They might be killing in the morning or cutting in the afternoon. You're not in an assembly line where you're cutting one section of each pig that comes through and moves on to the next person. So we're gonna stop with our list of principles here just on the basis of time. And I'd like to end with a description of the nonprofit 900 acre certified organic and biodynamic Hawthorne Valley Farm in Ghent, New York. A farm that encompasses in one story, each of the Jewish principles we've laid out. And it's not a Jewish farm in any way. So Martin Ping, uh, who's the executive director of Hawthorne Valley Farm um, and his colleague, Stefan Schneider, pictured there, distinguished between what they describe as farming 2.0, which is agribusiness that produces most of our food, and farming 3.0, which is committed to protecting the health of the earth and its people. <laughs> Biodynamic farming uses organic methods, starts with organic, but in addition, requires the well-being of the soil, the plants, the animals, the farmers, and frankly, anyone else on the farm. The culmination of agriculture 3.0, uh, says Martin, is this, quote, you should be able to eat a piece of broccoli and experience the broccoliness. It's, it's essence just exploding in your mouth because the conditions were created for that broccoli to come to its best expression. Martin summarizes the farm's mission this way. We're hoping that we contribute to helping consumers recognize the value, better tasting, healthier, of food grown in a conscious way by adequately paid farmers his heroes and ours, by the way, in this equation, on a farm with well-treated animals and, and well-treated soil. What an expression of Baal Tashkit, Sa'ar Baalei Chaim, and Oshek. So thanks for listening. And if you want more information, I'm going to just put up here um, our uh, uh, web, uh, website, berkshiresandbeyond.com. You're welcome to contact us, and we'll be happy to respond. So, Sarah Kay, any questions? Oh boy, are there questions. First of all, thank you. That was beautiful. It was holy and it was very, very interesting. So thank you. I, I think everyone is, I see a lot of big nods and smiles. So I think that you just made 
you know, 120 people very happy. <laughs> Thank you. We're happy it's over. Thanks. <laughs> Okay. First question. So what are what are some of the ways that we can find um, buy locally grown food and support these farmers? Sure. Okay. So great question. Uh, a few uh, few answers. Number one, uh, go to the farmers market. Uh, I uh, the farmers markets in the Berkshires are open. I know of other communities farmers markets have open. I think the New York farmers markets uh, have opened. I'm not absolutely sure, but I think so. So obviously that's, that's a great spot to buy, buy locally. Secondly, if you do have access to a farm that has a CSA, and we discussed this in our book, Community Supported Agriculture, in which you buy a share of the farmer's produce at the beginning of the season, and that helps the farmer, and then it helps you by getting fresh uh, produce and, and meat grown on the farm. That's another way. You can also go to your local store wherever you shop. And uh, these days, obviously, it's challenging for everybody. But you can ask your, your grocer, your store, your, your store owner, manager uh, to carry locally grown food. And finally, I would just say there are many organizations that support local farmers. In the Berkshires, we have Berkshire Grown. In the Pioneer Valley, there's CISA. So we're happy to send you info if you're interested, but you can help them. And you can also go online. There's a website called local, localharvest.org. Lists CSAs all over the country, farmers markets all over the country. So even if you live in New York City, you can get access to CSAs or wherever you're living. So that's gonna lead me right into my next question, which is how do we get food this good to the masses, you know, how, how do, what about people who can't afford a farmer's market? What, do you have suggestions? So what we didn't get to talk about is there's actually a huge, a huge effort on the part of these farmers and others to try to get um, locally grown food, healthy food uh, to people who can't afford it. And I'll just tell you about one story, and, but there's many, many stories like this. And by the way, even though these farmers are hardly making money, uh, many of them give away CSA shares. Many of them donate food. I mentioned Hawk Dance. Hawk Dance, uh, they, they sell at a farmer's market, and I know that they give away the farmer's market food that's left over. Um, it, it's, an inc it's an extraordinary group of people, but I do want to mention one thing. So I mentioned Hawthorne Valley Farm. They're part of a group that is it's a very large group in, in the um, Hudson Valley that it actually has created a store in Hudson, New York, and also has a like a rolling truck, whatever, that goes all through the area, selling local food at prices that people can pay. People basically pay what they want. Mm. It's an extraordinary, it's, there's also a, a foundation, Berkshire Taconic Foundation that's involved with it. Uh, I think the Sylvia Center um, as well in Hudson Valley, a whole bunch of groups. Mm. These kind of efforts are going on all over the place. It's not a total solution. We have a long way to go, mm. but I want, we want to give the um, idea or offer the idea that people do care about this issue. I appreciate that answer. You just, I think you made it more inclusive for everybody. Oh, um, yes. Next, um, someone wanted to know, when you meet a farmer for the first time, what's the first question you ask? What's your, what's your way of interacting with the farmer to get to know them and what they're all about? Oh, <laughs> that's well, a good question. I it's a great it. question. Well, you know, we do come, we do come from the food business, so we know something about agriculture and we know something about farming. Um, but you know, we're curious and we we hang around. I followed a corn farmer, uh, Bruce Howden, is an amazing, amazing person. I think Bruce is now about nine ninety, uh, but I couldn't keep up with him, and I basically jumped on a truck with him and followed him along as he was harvesting corn. And, you know, we, we literally, you know, I wouldn't say we lived with uh, the farmers, but we spent hours and hours and hours and sometimes days and constantly going back. And I'll tell you, one of the great pleasures of this experience has been getting the calls from the farmers uh, who have generally been very happy. Dave Levitt, who is one of our Jewish farmers, actually, we, we talk about Dave's melons. We have a wonderful recipe, which actually Joy Levitt, I know it's one of your favorites, the chilled melon soup. Dave called me the other day and he was thrilled to see his photograph in the book and the recipe and his write-up. So we've become friends with many of the farmers and it's, it, it, it has taken years though. But it, look, it's, it's a really good question that I don't want to um, underemphasize. Um, it, it's not easy. I mean, we certainly go in and say we've been in the area for 35 years, but we are not permanent residents and we're not farmers. And, you know, there is that chasm, but that'd be great. And I will add, though, 
it is hard to get farmers to return calls. Oh, and email. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why the book took about uh, six years, years rather okay. than three, but yeah. Um, next question. Um, how do people get a list of all of these amazing farmers? Well, uh, yeah, well, I just say, uh, certainly, um, you know, we have a list um, in the book, but we also on our, on our uh, Facebook page, on our website, which I mentioned, berkshiresandbeyond.com, actually, we have a, a complete list of every farmer we discussed, every farmer that we wrote about, and other farmers that we didn't have time to write about. So I would suggest actually going to our website, and right. it's got uh, all their contact info, and it actually has up-to-date information about what they're doing now during the pandemic, their farm stores, uh, you know, the type of business they're doing. That's what I would suggest. I know also that Rafi, your son, um, posted in the chat that berkshiregrown.org is a great um, resource for people looking to understand sort of the interconnected food web of the Berkshires. So, yeah. so yes, um, Berkshire Grown um, publish, uh, publishes a list every year of all the local farmers. Yeah. And you'll find that groups like Berkshire Go Grown, CISA in the Pioneer Valley, et cetera, my guess is every single one of them in that particular, mm -hmm. in a particular area will publish a list of all the farmers in the area who are members of, of uh, that particular organization, which promotes local farmers. Yeah, and Berkshire Grown, uh, they just published their Find Your Farmer directory, which also has a very extensive list of all the farmers, everything they grow and produce. And are there places that all these farmers come together? Do they, are, are they ever, you know, like, is the farmer's market the one place or do they also sort of like have town halls or connect in other ways? Yeah, great question. So, so it's, these are great questions. So the answer is uh, two things. Um, look, I don't know everything about farmers' social lives, but I will tell you that the farmers work so hard that their time during the summer, particularly, is so limited in mm. getting together. I, we just are in awe of the kinds of things they do. But there's one farmer in the area, this is Indian Line a Farm, yeah. Elizabeth Keene, who started um, something like the Old Granges of, uh, of yesteryear where farmers in this is South Berkshires would come and get together and socialize for precisely this reason, right. because farmers are sort of doing their thing, you know, on their own. So, yeah. so yes. But, but would you say they're siloed? Sorry, that was a farm <laughs> joke. Uh, they have Very to get tough. out in the field, but there's also, uh, there is a farm bureau, uh, Berkshire Farm Bureau, bureau, and there are also organizations that, um, help younger farmers get into farming. There are a number of organizations where people get together. They, I would say the one beautiful thing about farmers in the Berkshires and the chefs, they're very collaborative. They share with each other. They're very friendly. They help each other. Um, so they, they, like, they, they, they like to work together. Yeah, one, of, one of the chefs, um, actually it was Peter Platt, um, said that he really loves the fact that in the Berkshires, reviews basically aren't written of restaurants. They, they really aren't. And he says, you know, his day off, it's wonderful. Well, he doesn't have days off that often in the summer and right. normal times or whatever. But he loves the fact that he can go visit any, any chef that, because again, it's a really collaborative group. Um, I'm looking at the time, so I know you, <laughs> we don't have a lot of time left, so. Uh, so, so this is sort of a, a different kind of question. Someone was asking, if you want to start growing something in your home, you know, what, do you have a suggestion about a good first, you know, food to grow? <laughs> oh, let's boy. Let's get Ra uh, Rafi. Well, Rafi, I know, is on this. And Rafi, I if, you can, if you can unmute Rafi, he'll tell you the answer to that. I uh -huh. can unmute Rafi, a surprise guest. Hi, Rafi. I, I, was, I was ready and waiting. Well, okay, hello, good. everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful session. Uh, and it's I'm a totally family up, affair. Totally unbiased here. Um, you know, I'm planting our, our garden now uh, for the first time well, since I farmed and since I was probably eight, um, just being home during this pandemic. Um, and there are some amazingly easy things, even just a container to, to get growing on your own veggies. Greens, arugula, green mixes will start coming in within 15 to 25 days, um, even in just a small container. Um, if you have more space, squash, cucumbers, are all super easy but gardening is a very just like cooking is a very kind of open source community and there's so much amazing resources and facebook groups and forums and you know and even just go to your local nursery um try not to go to a big box store to buy plants if possible one it's nice to keep your money in the local economy and also um it's you can go to a local nursery and just pick pick their brains about people who've been doing this for for generations so 
Um, um, yeah, so I, I, those are some great suggestions. Johnny'sSeeds.com is kind of one of the main sources here in the U.S. for great seeds. And um, but but don't be intimidated. Go to your local hardware store and just pick up a packet of a greens mix and throw it in a pot with some potting soil and a little compost, and you'll and you'll be off to the races. Amazing, beautiful. Thank you, Thanks. Your parents are beaming at you right now. You should know that. I'm, I just literally was in the field all day planting our garden, so it's it's very. <laughs> So actually, that sort of leads me nicely to another question, which is, I know you guys really do care about supporting local, not just in terms of farms, but also in terms of bookstores. So I'm sure there's a lot of people right now that want to buy this book. Do you, we can't really like, you know, advocate selling it as a Jewish holiday, but can you give people like one or two suggestions of small, small sure. book shops that they could buy your book in? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll get to the New York specifically because there are New York ones as well. Look, there are local bookstores right now, and I don't know exactly what's going on in New York at the moment. I know in the Berkshires, um, you can at least, bookstores will put books outside for you and let you pick them up. So if you can do a local bookstore, great. If you can't do a local bookstore, go to book, uh, bookshop.org, which is a nonprofit. Uh, it's, it was basically developed to help um, independent bookstores sell their books. And you can go online, buy the books like you would on Amazon. Uh, you can actually go onto it and name a bookstore, um, a local bookstore who will get more of the proceeds of that book uh, if you name the local bookstore. Otherwise, all uh, local bookstores get a portion of the proceeds. And I don't know all the intricacies, but it's a great website. I have to tell you, honestly, I started using it a lot. Mm. Do you know the bookstores specifically in New and, York? No, I, I just say, again, after the holiday, you're welcome to contact us through the, through the website, and we can find you know, local bookstores that are carrying the book. In our area, they are. Yeah, but I'm thinking yeah. New York for people. In New York, too. Yeah, yeah. We, can, we can help you with that. Can you speak to natural kind of, um, I, this isn't the right word, but like pesticides, or how do you keep, you know, critters out of a, you know, a smaller farm? Uh, <laughs> you want to get Rafi back uh, again? Get, get, get you can see the who farmer. the farmer is. Yeah. We just write about it. He's the farmer. <laughs> Yeah. Rafi, are you willing? We, we also have one. Sure, sure. It's just, Rafi, uh, I mean, I am, let me be clear. I'm, I am a very inexperienced farmer, but I was lucky enough to, to learn from some very experienced farmers, certainly here and, and um, at, um, at the Yale Sustainable Food Program, where I worked on the farm, and which was an amazing, um, amazing program. And, and there, it really depends on the critter, it depends on the pest, depends on the animal, and depends on where you are. Um, but the good news is, um, so it's a very specific nuance thing, but there are um, many ways to deter pests and critters organically in a very humane way. Um, some of them as simple as uh, many, many pests, um, like, like actual bugs, are, are repelled by various essential oils and, um, and sensitive to smells in that regards. Um, when we talk about birds and waterfowl coming and eating spinach, we're putting up streamers and like mechanical things to deter them. Mm. Um, so it really depends. But again, I would, so if I'm going to reference one book, that's not my parents' cookbook, that's uh, focused on the technical gardening aspect. Um, Elliot Coleman, and my, my, my mom and I have talked about this book, Elliot Coleman, who's a farmer up in Maine and one of the original, like Back to the Landers, his book, The New Organic Grower, um, uh, but just type in Elliot Coleman gardening. Um, but yeah, I want to say The New Organic Grower is like the Bible of organic gardening and, and can't recommend it enough. Uh, by Amazing. the way, I think there's a new edition of that book. And also, yes. I just want to mention one other thing. What was extraordinary about the farmers we interviewed, Rafi, thank you, saved us on that one, um, <laughs> is, is that the far many some of the farmers came to farming and they had no idea what they were doing. I think of a, mm. our, a shiitake uh, mushroom grower who called universities all over the place that had agricultural schools. Ditto, by the way, for uh, Dave Levitt of Dave's Melons. He, ba he basically, he called UMass Amherst. You know, uh, and, uh, Dave, uh, when he spoke to me the other day, and I said, Dave, how are you doing? He said, well, I'm still growing. I've been doing this 35 years, and it's still a mystery to me. I'm still learning. So they're, they're all learning. It's, uh, yeah. Ag, ag extensions. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of, you know, resources that you can go to, and, and a lot of farmers learn to do it that way. In the two minutes we have left, do you have a sense of how um, this pandemic is impacting farmers? Yeah, yes, um, we are, I would say, of course, their challenge as we all are, especially because the restaurants have not been open. Um, of course, they're doing takeout. So the farmers who rely on the restaurants as their customers, they're hurting. That said, I would say virtually all of the farmers that we profile are, are operating, their CSAs are just booming because uh, folks are, you know, are shopping them. Shopping, right. 
Yeah, farm stores are doing very well. So they're actually, they're doing a lot of business. But of course, uh, I would say the big challenge right now, of course, is the restaurants and those who rely on food and I, I would just also add, yeah, restaurants for sure, huge, but huge issue. But the other issue um, is the distribution issue. So farmers are growing, farmers are doing, and some of them can do it directly, but not mm -hmm. everybody has the ability to do it. And the issue of distribution for local farmers, which we can't get into right now, is yeah. a huge issue huge. Yeah. and worth discussing at some other time. Um, but now it's a very big issue. Yeah. How do you get a, a two acre farm? How do you get their produce to people? Like to, let's say New York. To people who want it. People want it. Oh, we're frustrated. We'd love to talk more, but I that know. Was, this I was incredible. Thank you to both of you. Thank you to um, at least two of your sons who have been helping out, I believe, in the chat. So, uh, very very loving, amazing, much. supportive family. Um, and I just want to thank, you know, the like 120 people that have been in this call. This was our, you know, one of our opening sessions of our first ever virtual Tikkun. You're yes. sort of making JCC history with us. And the to the builders, you did such a spectacularly beautiful job. Thank you so much. You Thank you all of you. Thank Social you. justice, Jewish yeah. life, you know, modern Corona realness. Like this, this is it. Could it does, doesn't get better than this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for being and here. And Hoxton, man.